Good evening. It is good to be with you again in the name of the Lord Jesus. And since our schedule is very full, I believe, tomorrow, I want to say tonight to make sure I get a chance how much our family has been enjoying this conference. You've done a wonderful job welcoming us, and it's been great to be with you. We're really enjoying it. And my children have been making some new friends as well as seeing a few friends they knew from before over in Houston. So we're glad to rekindle some former friendships and to make new friends. And we do appreciate your kindness and love in our Lord. Also, so very encouraging to hear throughout the conference about the work that the Lord is doing through different brothers and sisters. And I trust you're part of the work of God, whoever you are tonight, that you know the Lord and that you're using whatever gift or ability that he has given you to do what he wants you to do where you are. And we can't all go to India, we can't all go to Mexico, we can't go to many places. I mean, we're just one person, each of us, right? But the Lord wants you to do something. So may you be encouraged by the Holy Spirit tonight to continue to serve the Lord, or if you're not really actively doing that, to put aside other things and to give yourself to the Lord for his use. Ruth chapter 2 is where we are tonight. We're going to also cover chapter 3, although not in the same detail. Ruth chapter 2 and verse 8 is where we want to begin our reading this evening. Ruth 2 and verse 8. So I'm planning on speaking about 45 minutes. Is that fair? Because we're slightly, we actually, you gave it to me earlier than anticipated. So I'm just going to go with that and try to go for 8.45 as my cutoff point. Ruth chapter 2 and verse 8. Then Boaz said to Ruth, You will listen, my daughter, will you not? Do not go to glean in another field, nor go from here, but stay close by my young women. Let your eyes be on the field which they reap, and go after them. Have I not commanded the young men not to touch you? And when you're thirsty, go to the vessels and drink from what the young men have drawn. So she fell down on her face, bowed to the ground, and said to him, Why have I found favor in your eyes, that you should take notice of me, since I am a foreigner? And Boaz answered and said to her, It has been fully reported to me all that you have done for your mother-in-law, since the death of your husband, and how you have left your father and your mother in the land of your birth, and have come to a people whom you did not know before. The Lord repay your work, and a full reward be given you by the Lord God of Israel, under whose wings you have come for refuge. Then she said, Let me find favor in your sight, my Lord, for you have comforted me, and have spoken kindly to your maidservant, though I'm not like one of your maidservants. Now Boaz said to her at mealtime, Come here and eat of the bread, and dip your piece of bread in the vinegar. And she sat beside the reapers, and he passed parched grain to her. And she ate and was satisfied, and kept some back. And when she rose up to glean, Boaz commanded his young men, saying, Let her glean even among the sheaves, and do not reproach her. Also let grain from the bundles fall purposely for her. Leave it that she may glean, and do not rebuke her. Now our family likes children. We have four, as you know, that the Lord has given to us, and we like other people's children as well. One of the great things about a conference is to come and see the young ones, to come and see teenagers, to come and see adolescents, to come and see Uh, you know, kids that are elementary school age, and I especially like the really little ones because they are so cute. And sure enough, when we were here last evening, uh, there were some folks that were assembling to enjoy some delectable Indian food, and I don't miss that kind of invitation. I I said, yes, that's right. I'm with that. I have the gift of eating Indian food. Uh, You won't find it in Ephesians 4 or 1 Corinthians 12, but... I think, anyway, in my world, it's a gift. Uh, In any case, 
I went through and I got my Indian food and I came out to the little lobby area on the second floor by my bedroom and there were these little tables there and these nice plush chairs. So I sat down there and I began to look at my food and I was sort of distracted by my own children. And there was this cute little girl about two or three years old. I don't really know how old she is. I know her name, but I won't say it because I don't want to embarrass her family. Although there's no cause for embarrassment because this was just so cute. And she was hanging out with my youngest daughter, who's 10, Fiona. And so she was there kind of sitting by Fiona. And uh, the next thing I knew, I didn't notice this, but my wife, Naomi, had put down her plate next to me. So there I am with my plate, and I'm looking over here, I think my son, if I recall correctly, and Naomi had to go away to check on the older kids to make sure that they were doing all right. So she left her plate there. So I'm there looking at this other kid, and I turn around, and this little girl is there, and she's like, this is really good. Yum, yum. And I realize she's eating my wife's food. And she even said, I want a fork, which... Unfortunately, that seemed too American for me. You know, you should use the chapati. You know, I don't want to be formal, but she wanted a fork, so we got her a fork. And, well, I just left. I just thought this was so cute. And I couldn't help but think of that little girl as I thought about this passage in Ruth. Because this is one of my favorite portions in the Old Testament and probably my favorite portion in the book of Ruth because it's mealtime. And it's not just because it's mealtime, it's that Ruth comes to that table and she's welcome. And she can have to eat. And she can not only eat and enjoy it, but she can be satisfied. The same way that little girl in all of her, you know, childlike innocence is just there saying, oh, someone's put yummy food here, I ought to eat it. And, and Ruth comes there and is brought into this wonderful meal. And I thought, you know, that's just like our God, because over and over again in the Bible, he puts meals. The Lord Jesus himself used that figure of a meal in many of his parables. And when he spoke about his kingdom, he talked about people coming from the east and the west and the north and the south. So, you know, all the regions were covered, east Texas and west Texas, right? Okay, that's a Texas joke anyway, sorry. You know the bumper sticker. I'm not from Texas, but I got here as soon as I could, right? But all those people, said the Lord, coming from east and from west and from north and from south and sitting down with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob in the kingdom. And you think, what a wonderful figure that is. Because when you want to get to know someone, there's no better way, in my estimation, to do it than over food. Now, not just because I like to eat. That's evident as you look at me. But it's because when we come together for food, there's that relaxation, there's that enjoyment, there's that familial sense that we are brothers and sisters coming together to eat. Now, as extraordinary as it is to come together and eat with other believers. And I always count that a great privilege, wherever I am in the world, to sit down and eat with brothers and sisters. That's tremendous. But how much more so when we think about the Lord Jesus Christ being the host at the heavenly banquet, that Revelation 19, for example, speaks about the marriage supper of the Lamb. And the Lord Jesus is there as the host of that meal. Now, symbolically at least, we have an anticipation of that in our age right now, don't we? We're going to be celebrating it tomorrow morning. We're going to be remembering the Lord Jesus in the way that he has commanded us to do. We're going to take very simple symbols, bread in some form and a cup in some form, and we are going to remember that the Lord Jesus, the eternal Son of God, became a man. That the Word, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. That Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And he took on human flesh for the very purpose of becoming our kinsman, 
of relating himself to us. And one of the major ideas of the book of Ruth that we're going to camp out on tonight as we think about Boaz is something I mentioned this morning, that there's a word used of Boaz that some of our translations say kinsman, some of them say redeemer, but I like what David Gooding said. He said it's really kinsman redeemer. You put them together with a hyphen. And it's a wonderful idea that here is someone who's related to us so he can take up our burden. He can take our indebtedness. We sing it sometimes. He paid a debt he did not owe. I owed a debt I could not pay. I needed someone to wash my sins away. Very simple words, but profound truth, isn't it? That the Son of God himself would become our kinsman. That he's not ashamed to call us brethren, Hebrews 2 says. Why not? Because he's been made like unto us. Just as we were partakers in flesh and blood, he likewise took part of the same. Now, we didn't ask to be born, right? We just showed up. I showed up three months early. I was a great surprise, you know? My mother said, no, I'm not having a baby. This is just premature labor. It's too early. And a friend who had stopped by to see how she was doing, he was a chiropractor. He said, no, uh, you're going to have this baby, and I'm going to drive you to the hospital to have the baby. So I thank God that he sent that man along, and I was born in a hospital instead of in the family living room. And, uh, you know, we didn't ask to be here necessarily. We just showed up one day. And here we were, we came into the world and kind of bewildered, kind of wondering, where am I? What's this all about? The first thing I got here, somebody smacked me on the bottom. What what is this all about, right? But when Hebrews 2 talks about the Lord taking part of the same, it actually uses a different word in the original language. We took part in flesh and blood because that's our common lot. That's what we are as human beings. We were created by God on purpose. We're not here accidentally. We're not the product of chance and natural forces that are mindlessly working to to put us here. No, we were made by God. We were created in the image of God. So there's a great deal of dignity. There's a great deal of worth to every human life because we were made by God. But in contrast even to that, the Lord Jesus, who was God, who is God, who eternally always shall be God, the Lord Jesus voluntarily took part of the same. In other words, he voluntarily became a human man just so he could be our kinsman, just so he could be related to us, just so he could say, that's the family I want to be connected to. Now, sometimes we have families that make the news not in a good way. I remember uh, probably 15, 16 years ago, maybe a little longer ago, around the time that you all down here in Texas were having the Enron scandal. Do you remember the Enron scandal? There were a couple of different scandals around the country, not all pertaining to the same industry. We had someone in Pennsylvania who was in the telecommunications business. And this man, I won't say his name, but this man came from a very rural, remote part of Pennsylvania, a place that our family likes to go camping, about four and a half hours from where we live. And when we'd go up into that area, we'd see this man's workers' trucks for his telecom uh, company. And, And he would pay for his workers to come up there to a hotel and to go deer hunting. Now, if you want to get yourself in good with a Pennsylvanian, you know, pay for their hunting trip. This was a perk for working for this man. And he had invested all kinds of money in the the county seat, the city, or it was really a town, that was the county seat, the capital of that county, if you will. And he had done all kinds of philanthropic things. But then it came out that he had actually illicitly taken billions of dollars, not just hundreds of millions, but billions of dollars. Then he had broken federal laws, and suddenly this man who before, when you'd mentioned his name, oh, everybody thought this fellow was wonderful because he was so philanthropic and so generous and so charitable, now his name was mud, if you'll pardon the expression, 
because nobody wanted to be connected with him. Now there was scandal. Now the corruption of this man and the wrong things he had done came out. And even his own children started to distance themselves publicly from him, at least what was said in the newspapers. Now think of it. We all were like that crooked businessman. We were all like that man, corrupt. We as human beings are fallen. We are messed up by sin. We are broken. We have all sinned and fall short of the glory of God. You extend wonderful courtesy to me as a speaker here. You insist I go in ahead of you. You won't let me hold the door, some of you, for you. No, no, you go first, brother. You're so kind. I appreciate the respect. But, you know, I can't let that go to my head. Because what am I? I'm a sinner. <laughs> I'm somebody, thankfully, by the grace of God, redeemed and saved and accepted in the beloved. When the Lord looks at me, when, when God the Father sees me, he sees me in Christ. But I'm not inherently better than any other human being on earth, much less my brothers and sisters in Christ. And Brother Ray was sharing from Galatians 3 this morning that equality that we have in Christ, that all of these social distinctions and all of these things that the world makes so much of, they fall away because now there's the simple question, do you belong to Christ? Are you in Christ? Well, once in Christ, in Christ forever, the hymn writer says. If you're in Christ, you're accepted in the beloved one. But if you don't know the Lord Jesus Christ, it doesn't matter how nice you are. It doesn't matter how good you try to be. It doesn't matter all the philanthropy you may do. You're lost. You're on your way to hell. If you leave this world without Christ, you'll be lost for eternity in the lake of fire. That's awful. Because the Lord Jesus came down, and in spite of the fact that we have all sinned, past tense, and fall short of the glory of God, present tense. That means even on my best day as a Christian, I'm still no more deserving of the grace of God. There is no deserve when we talk about the grace of God. There is no merit. This is God freely giving us in Christ what we couldn't earn, couldn't buy, couldn't deserve, no matter what we say, do, or buy, or whatever. We can't do it. All we can do is come to the Lord like beggars and say, thank you, Lord, for saving my soul. I was a bankrupt. I was like Ruth. I came out of a strange country, and I couldn't demand anything from you. And the Lord says, yes, I know. In fact, this is the very reason I came from heaven. I came to be a man so that I could take up your indebtedness. Now imagine that. Think of that corrupt businessman I spoke about a few moments ago. Do you think I would want to say, oh, I hope that man adopts me? I mean, his own children don't want to be associated with him. He's passed away now, so I guess it's, it's not an issue. He's gone on to a higher judgment. I hope he received Christ before he left this world. But think of the Lord Jesus. He doesn't care about what we were and all that we've done in one sense. I mean, yes, he cares as the righteous judge of the universe, but that notwithstanding, he wants us to be his brothers and sisters. He wants us to be in his family. He wants to associate himself with us and take our demerit, our shame, all the wrong we've done. The Lord Jesus would take that for us. And then the Lord Jesus says, having saved you from your great debt, having extricated you from the guilt that your sins caused, now beginning the process of saving you from the power of sin to one day save you from the presence of sin. Do you know what I really want from you? I want a relationship with you. I want communion with you. I want fellowship with you. So when we come together at the Lord's Supper and we look at that bread, we think of this as the Son of God who loved me, loved me so much that he came down to this earth to become a man. Why become a man? So he might take my indebtedness and carry it to the cross of Calvary and pay for it there by giving his own life, by shedding his precious blood. 
And when I take the cup, I think about the Son of God who gave himself unreservedly, that he poured out his soul unto death, that that life's blood, the life of the flesh is in the blood, says Leviticus, that life's blood was poured out as a sacrifice. And that sacrifice has made for us a new covenant with God. Now, we always like that part of the new covenant that says, their sins and iniquities I will remember no more. That's a marvelous word, isn't it? That God will not judicially raise our sins and iniquities. If we're in Christ, they are paid for. God's never going to bring them up against us and say, you know that sin you committed back in 1984? Sorry, uh, you're not getting into heaven on account of that. No, if we're in Christ... We're going right into heaven where he is. In fact, it's so sure if you're a believer in Christ, God already sees you as seated there. But that's not all the new covenant says. It says he will be our God and we shall be his people. We who were not a people. You remember the book of Hosea talks about that? Lo ami, not a people. And 1 Peter 2 picks up that idea and says, We who were not a people have now been made the people of God. We who had not obtained mercy, lo ruchamach, we have now received mercy in Christ. We get it through him, don't we? And not only that, we will know the Lord. What salvation is about is having that relationship with the Lord where we know him, we get to know the Lord more and more and more. I've often said to Naomi, we've just celebrated by God's grace 16 years of marriage just a couple of weeks ago. And I told her, I say this often, Naomi, I married you to spend time with you, okay? You might think that I'm a little bit crazy that way, but I enjoy being with my wife. There's actually nobody I'd rather be with. I enjoy being with her. Now think of it. The most interesting person in the universe is God. By definition, he has to be, right? He's the maker and creator of all things. He's the all-wise God. And in the Lord Jesus, Colossians 2 says, all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge are hidden in him. So you don't have to look out there for wisdom. You don't have to look over here for wisdom. You don't have to go anywhere else. The Lord Jesus, if you'll pardon the expression, is one-stop shopping. As Colossians 2.10 says, And ye are complete in him who is the head of every principality and power. The most interesting, most wise, most powerful, most magnificent, most altogether lovely being in the universe wants to have a relationship with you. He wants you to walk with him. He wants you to talk with him. He wants you to tell him all about your troubles, even though he knows about them already. He wants to hear your side. He wants you to unburden yourself on him. He says, casting all your care upon him, for he careth for you. And he wants you to sit down at his table and have fellowship with him. Now, you thought I'd never get there, but that brings us back to the story of Ruth. Because Boaz comes on the scene, and he inquires who this young woman is, and when he's told who she is, he's obviously already heard about her. He says, it's been fully reported to me all that you did for your mother-in-law. And he he says it, I love uh, what he says to her here in verse number 11, It has been fully reported to me all that you've done for your mother-in-law since the death of your husband and how you left your father and your mother and the land of your birth and have come to a people whom you did not know before. Now, think about this. He could have said, it's been fully reported to me that you're destitute, that you have nothing. It's been fully reported to me that there's nothing you bring to the table. You're not coming to my field giving me anything. I'm already rich. I already have position in this society. I'm in a shame and a blame culture. You from India, you from uh, different parts of the Middle East, you might have grown up in some of the Emirates as some of my friends have, or in Kuwait as others of my friends have. You have more of that sense of honor and that sense of 
public esteem and the esprit de corps of a community where it's important what others think about you. There's nothing that Ruth, the Moabitess, is bringing that can enrich Boaz in and of herself. He could have said, I've heard all about you, and you've got nothing that you can give to me, and I'm not interested in you. Thank you very much. Good day. Go find another field. A lot of men in Israel probably would have said that. But Boaz was a God-fearing man. A man of virtue and a man of character. A man who believed in the Lord. And he looked past her origins. He looked past her background. And he said here, The Lord repay you, verse 12, your work. And a full reward be given you by the Lord God of Israel, under whose wings you've come for refuge. Now that's what he's looking at. He's saying, you know what? When I look at you, I see somebody who has come to the God of Israel. Somebody who recognizes she doesn't have anything. Somebody who recognizes she needs a savior. Somebody who recognizes she needs a new life. But you've come to the right place. You've come to the Lord God of Israel. And you're taking refuge under the shadow of his wings. Now that's a great biblical phrase. Psalm 63 verse 7 uses that phrase, the Lord has been my help, and so I dwell underneath the shadow of his wings. And Psalm 91 alludes to it when it says, he that abides in the shadow of the Almighty, uh, or sorry, he that, let me read it, because I'm going to misquote it for you, sorry about that. Psalm 91, verse 1, and you'll recognize the phraseology from the title of Jim Elliot's biography, no doubt, written by his widow, Elizabeth Elliot, Psalm 91, verse 1, He who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress, my God in Him I will trust. And maybe most famously and poignantly, this idea of the Lord overshadowing us with His wings was used by the Lord Jesus Himself when he came to Jerusalem for the last time, when he was on the verge of going to the cross at Golgotha, and he stood outside Jerusalem at the end of Matthew 23, and he said, Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem. Now, in the Semitic languages, when you repeat a name like that, or when you repeat a concept, it intensifies it. And when you're talking about a person or a place like Jerusalem, it's a depth of emotion. So when the Lord says, Martha, Martha, you are cumbered about with many things and much service. The Lord isn't trying to bust on Martha and put Martha down. He's lovingly saying, oh, Martha, I wish you'd really get what this is all about. It's not about working yourself ragged to the expense of enjoying my presence. First and foremost, it's about knowing me. It's worship first, and then it's service. Or how he says in Acts 9, the risen Christ speaking from heaven says, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? Well, at the end of Matthew 23, the Lord says, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou that stonest the prophets and killest those who were sent unto thee, how often would I have gathered thee as a mother hen gathers her chicks? but you would not. Now that's the kind of instinctive, protective gesture that nature furnishes us of true maternity. That a mother might be weaker than the assailant, might be weaker than the predator. And the only thing she can do to protect her young is to put her wings over top of it. And it might mean the death of that mother hen but she's going to die trying to give what kind of protection, what kind of shelter to her young. And here the Lord Jesus is standing outside of the city that really within a very short time is going to reject him. They're going to cast him out of the city. Hebrews 13 says he's going to go forth outside the camp in the Jewish mind. He's going to go to the unclean place. He's going to go uh, bearing away where the sin offering went out. 
and where the unclean things were taken away from the sacrifices. That's where the Lord's going to be sent out as if he were something unclean. And all in all, all the Lord Jesus wants to do is protect this city, protect this people, put his wings over them and shield them and shelter them. And the Lord said, but ye would not. It was hidden from them. And because they wouldn't receive the Lord's protection then, they wouldn't be protected when the Romans came against them in AD 70 and when that city was destroyed. And still today, Israel's looking for security. They're looking for protection. And they're looking for it in all the wrong places. Because it's not about what kind of fighter jets you have or what kind of tanks you have or what kind of tech you have or intelligence services. Israel has among the finest in the world in all of those fields. But at the end of the day, the only thing in this world that gives you true security, in fact, the only one, I will say, who gives you security is the living God. The God who offers his wings, sorry about that, the God who offers his wings and says, come and I'll shelter you. I will bear the storm for you. The Lord Jesus is that one, one of our hymns says, thy open bosom was my ward, it bore the storm for me. It's that picture of us coming under the shelter of a rock and instead of the storm breaking on us, the fury of that storm breaks on the rock. And Boaz says, welcome to my field, Ruth. Welcome to my table, in fact, because I know why you're here. You're looking for protection, not from me primarily, but from God primarily. You're looking for him to put his wings over you. And may you find what you're looking for because a seeking sinner who comes to the seeking savior isn't going to be sent away disappointed. You want security, you want protection, not for this life only, but in eternity. You want to be shielded from the wrath to come. It's only in the Lord Jesus that you can find that. That's why the Thessalonians, in 1 Thessalonians 1, 9 and 10, it says about them that they turn to God from idols to serve the living and true God and to wait for his son, Jesus Christ, whom he raised from the dead, the one who delivers us from the wrath to come. That's what they were waiting for. They said, we've tried the idols. We've tried the false gods. The hymn writer says, I tried the broken cisterns, Lord, but ah, the waters failed, uh, taking an image from Jeremiah 2. I, well, they, we tried it, you know, and it didn't work. So now we're turning away from all these vanities, all these futilities, all these empty things that cannot save. And we're casting ourselves on you, Lord. We're looking to you to shelter us. And the Lord, through his servant Boaz, tells her, you've come to the right place. Because first of all, as we saw this morning, he's told the other men there not to touch her. That she's already got security. As she goes out in the fields, all she has to do is worry about looking for those bits that have been left ungleaned or for any that the reapers may drop. Oh, and by the way, Boaz tells his men here, uh, after he feeds her, and we'll get back to the table in a moment, but after her, he feeds her, he says in verse 16 to his reapers, also let grain from the bundles fall purposefully for her. Leave it that she may glean and do not rebuke her. You want to come to my fields and you want to get something that's been left over or you want to get something that's been dropped that's great. That's what the law says. Leviticus 19, you've got chapter and verse. Leviticus 23 repeats it. You've got chapter and verse. But Ruth, I want you to have not just what the law demands, not just what the command tells me to do. I want you to have grace. I want you to have more, more than you can Look for, even though this is mercy that God put it in his law, that you as a stranger or you as a widow or the orphans can come and they can take from this field. That's wonderful. That's mercy. That's more than they deserved and more than they could find anywhere else. But for this woman, I'm going to give extra. Let fall handfuls on purpose for her. 
more. So much so that when she goes home at the end of the day, she's beaten out an ephah, which uh, from what I checked with the New English Translation's marginal note, that's like 29 to 30 gallons. <laughs> that gives me some impressive uh, respect. I'm impressed with Ruth's work ethic that she gets out there to get what Boaz is offering, that she takes advantage of the mercy he's offering and the grace he's showing her. And even when she's sitting at the table, look at the kindness to her as she comes to the table. He says, verse 14, come here and eat of the bread and dip your piece of the bread in the vinegar. So she sat beside the reapers and he passed parched grain to her and she ate and was satisfied. Now you don't come to the Lord's table and technically, there's a distinction in the New Testament, I know, between 1 Corinthians 10, the Lord's table, and 1 Corinthians 11, the Lord's supper. The Lord's supper is a subset of the Lord's table. The Lord's table is everything we enter into in fellowship with God when we come to know Christ. So it is our place as believers to be at the Lord's table every single day. As we come before the Lord in prayer, and we come before the Lord reading his word, and our hearts worship the Lord and praise the Lord for what he's done. And the Lord speaks to us. We're at the Lord's table. We ought to be there every day. But once a week, according to the pattern of the New Testament church, as seen in Acts 20, verse 7, for example, we come together on that resurrection day, the day of the week that the Lord Jesus rose again from the dead. And we take the symbols of the bread and the cup, and we remember the Lord Jesus and what he's done for us. And that naturally leads to worship and to praise, as well as it ought to lead to greater sanctification, because we come having examined ourselves. How's my walk with the Lord going? Am I really knowing the Lord? Or have I grown cold in my heart? Am I like... The, the bride in Song of Songs 5, who when he comes to the door, <laughs> well, I'd rather stay under the electric blanket, thank you very much, or the down comforter or whatever. You know, I washed my feet and, and I don't want to get up and get them dirty again. And do you know I just had a pedicure and all that? Okay, that's not in Song of Songs 5, but she had her excuses. And he spoke to her. <laughs> and she gets up and she comes to the door. She repents, as it were. She has a change of heart. She's been cold, but now his voice woos her. And when she comes to the door, he's gone. But he's left something on the door. The fragrance of himself, it's dripping with myrrh. This fragrant ointment that was used in embalming that speaks of death. And you remember, that was one of the gifts that the wise men brought to the Lord Jesus in his young toddlerhood there in Bethlehem. And what is it that brings our hearts back when we're cold? What is it when we've drifted away a little bit in our thinking or been distracted by this world? What is it that brings us back? Surely it's the death of the Lord Jesus. And when we come to that supper and we remember what the Lord Jesus has done for us, we say, we'll praise him for all that is past. And we'll trust him for all that's to come. Now, she ate and was satisfied. And I tell you, you can't go away from feeding on Christ and say, I'm dissatisfied. I'm hungry. I'm not content. The Lord even gives us the picture in the New Testament, doesn't he? As he feeds the 5,000, there was more left over. When they fed the 5,000, it was actually 5,000 men plus women and children. So it was a greater number than that. They took up 12 baskets of leftovers. One for each of the apostles to know what God is capable of doing. That his arm is not shortened. That there's no lack of bread from his table. And when they fed the 4,000, they took up seven baskets full. That biblical number of perfection. This is the God who can perfectly satisfy. And not only fed everyone and was satisfied, but there was more to spare. You'll never come to the Lord Jesus and really come to know him and go away and say, well, I tried him 
he just didn't work out for me. You know, he just didn't do it for me. No, if you think that, you haven't really encountered the biblical Christ. You haven't met the true and living God. You might have been inoculated against the truth, if you'll pardon the little vaccine terminology, but you've had just enough of Christianity or Christianese maybe to turn you off on the real thing. You think because you went to a VBS or a Sunday school or you grew up going to meetings that you know all about him, but you've never come as a repentant sinner. You've never come and said, Lord, I realize I deserve the lake of fire. I deserve to be cast out. But I thank you for your son loving me and giving himself for me and dying that I might be saved and rising again so that he could give me eternal life, that resurrection life. That will be what is the driving force in the age to come. As she sits at that table, she's satisfied. But there's a little historical touch here that is so realistic. She is coming back from famine conditions. She is coming back from hunger. And she eats enough and is satisfied. But the verse goes on to say she kept some back. Why did she keep some back? Well, we find out a few verses later that when she goes home to Naomi... It says in verse 18, so she brought out and gave to her what she had kept back after she had been satisfied. Isn't that lovely? She's not saying as some people can, and I've never been in this position, so I'm not one to talk about it, but I've read about refugees. I've read about people escaping the Holocaust. I've read about people in horrible circumstances and they're hungry. And thereafter for their lifelong For some of them, it becomes a fear. Am I going to run out of food? And some of them go to hoarding. You know, they kind of think it it might all go away. Not Ruth's instinct. She eats at Boaz's table and she's satisfied. And she takes home and she shares with Naomi. Because I tell you, if you feed at the Lord Jesus' table, if you walk with the Lord Jesus and know the Lord Jesus, not only will he feed you and satisfy you, but you're going to want to share him with other people. You're going to want to come and say, come and see this man. Come, like the woman at the well said in John 4, come and see a man who told me all things I ever did. (laughs) Isn't that extraordinary? A woman with such a checkered background, so many things to be ashamed of. A woman showing up at the well at the time she did, probably due to embarrassment for how she had lived and how she was even living then. And yet she meets the Lord and the embarrassment is gone because he lets her drink of the water of life freely and she goes away satisfied. She leaves her pot at the well. And her instinct is to go into the town and tell them, come and see this man, come and see the Lord Jesus. Well, as she sits at the table, Boaz gives her the good things and Boaz makes sure she's going to take a lot home. I can't help but think of another table, though, the night when the Lord Jesus was betrayed. And he sat down at that table, as recorded in John 13, with the twelve. And he said, as the other Gospels recorded, he said, I tell you the truth, that one of you shall betray me. And the way it's phrased in Matthew 26, for example, they each said, surely not I. I would never do that. I would never do something so heinous as betray you. And in John 13, I don't know whether Peter tossed an olive at John or what he did, but he got his attention somehow and said, ask him who it is. And the Lord Jesus said, it is he that when I have dipped the sop and given it to him, that's the one that's going to betray me. Now in that culture, I don't know if you have something like this in, in India or in any of the food you do, but I know in North Africa they, they have something like this. That if you have a guest of honor, you take some morsels that you have and you give that on a piece of bread or naan or whatever it is, chapati, I don't know, whatever they have on hand, and you present it to that guest of honor. And in that culture, it's an expression of friendship. So think about what the Lord's doing. The Lord is going to mark out a traitor. He's going to identify a Benedict Arnold or a Vidkin Quisling. 
Somebody who is the traitor in the midst, a fifth columnist, if you will. And the Lord's going to identify him. But he's not going to identify him in a way that subjects him to immediate vitriol on the part of the other apostles. In other words, he's not going to say, well, it's Judas Iscariot. Because can you imagine what they'd do? Peter would probably hit him with his shoe or something. I don't know. The Lord identifies Judas in a way that in retrospect, the apostles could look back and they could say, you know, the crucifixion wasn't accidental. The betrayal didn't take the Lord Jesus by surprise. He knew it all the time. He said back in John chapter 6, have not I chosen you 12 and yet one of you is a demon. So the Lord knew. He said earlier in John 13 when he was washing their feet, ye are clean, but not all of you. So 11 of those guys were already regenerate, were already believers, were already cleansed from their sin, not Judas. But what did that say to Judas? Well, of course it said, Jesus knows. He knows what I'm intending. He knows what the plan is. And yet because this is a gesture of honor, a gesture of friendship, it's as if the Lord Jesus is saying to Judas, now Judas, I know what you contemplate, but you don't have to do it. You say, well, wasn't Judas the son of perdition? Uh, wasn't it prophesied in Psalm 41 that he who has eaten bread with me will lift up his heel against me? Wasn't this identified from the past that God knew all along there would be this traitor? That the Lord Jesus would even pray in John 17, Father of those you've given me, I've lost none except for the betrayer that the scripture might be, except the son of perdition that the scripture might be fulfilled. Yes, all true. But the Lord still gives us the freedom to choose or reject. And if Judas had accepted the Lord's grace at that moment and said, Lord, you, you've got me. I've been contemplating the most foul, worst kind of thing. Please forgive me and save me from myself. Do you think the Lord would have saved him? I want to tell you, there's no one who's ever come to the Lord and asked him to save them who's meant business about that, that the Lord has turned them away. He says, he that comes unto me, I will in no wise cast out. He would have saved him. But Judas took that piece of bread. He accepted that gesture of friendship. And he went out and sold the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, I can't help but think of all our fellow human beings on this planet that day after day receive the sun that God has rising on them, that receive the rain. He causes it to rain on the just and the unjust and causes the sun to shine on the evil and the good. That they receive the providential benefits and mercies of God, that they are like King Belteshazzar, the God in whose hand your breath is and whose are all your ways you've not honored. They take from God all of the gestures of friendship and goodness and all of his entreaties and all of the wooing. And they say, I don't want you, thank you very much. I will sell you for what I can have in this world. And that's the choice, isn't it? You can come to the table like Ruth and you can say, you're just what I've been looking for. I've always wanted to eat and be satisfied. And I can take this home to Naomi, my mother-in-law, and I can show her I found somebody who can satisfy. Or you can be like Judas. You can take what the Lord gives you and you can say, it means nothing to me that you sent your son to die for me. It means nothing to me that the son went to the father's house to prepare a place for redeemed humanity. It means nothing to me, all of the goodness of God. The cross means nothing to me. And so many people say that in the world tonight. I hope it's not you. Because Ruth goes on from strength to strength. In chapter three, and we're about out of time, so I'll just summarize. She goes into the threshing floor where Boaz is beating out his barley. And it's now the time of barley and wheat harvest, chapter 3 tells us. So we're in between first fruits, which speaks of resurrection, and the Feast of Weeks, or Pentecost, as the New Testament calls it. 
There's a direct connection between those feasts as far as the timing of them and also a thematic connection. They're both feasts of first fruits because at Pentecost, God was going to begin something anew as well. Brother Ray spoke about it this morning. That's a little promo for people to get up for the devotional like me. I'm going to have my coffee IV plugged in tomorrow morning and uh, Naomi will get out the belt, Brother Ray. Don't worry, I'll be there. But anyway, Lord willing. Um, but he talked about Ephesians 2, how he's taken the two, Jew and Gentile, and he's made both one. And that happened on Pentecost because the resurrection life is a life that unites people of every kindred, of every tribe, of every tongue, Jew and Gentile, and makes them a habitation of God in the spirit, Ephesians 2 says. And it's at that very time, Ruth goes into Boaz and says, put your skirt over me. Now, symbolically, this was like putting your wing over me. Remember we talked about Boaz saying, you've come and trusted under the Lord to put under your wings? Well, she was saying to Boaz, give me your protection. What protection? Well, not just what he had already extended in his fields, but the protection of the kinsman redeemer, the one who would buy back the inheritance that her husband and her father-in-law and her brother-in-law lost in Moab, when they left from Moab at least. He would buy back that inheritance. But even more essential, he would raise up the name of her dead husband. Because when we talk about an inheritance, our lives aren't about the things we're building and the things we're doing. We receive from God. If you're going to have an eternal inheritance, it's something God gives you. And the picture in Israel was that this was God's land, but God wanted to share it with Israel. And he wanted every Israelite to know that even if they died, that their name would still be associated with that inheritance. And the wonderful thing about the work of God is if you're joined with the Lord Jesus in his inheritance, if you're co-heirs with him, as Romans 8 says, if you have in him an inheritance, as Ephesians 1 says, that cannot be lost. And that's the picture of what Boaz is going to do for Ruth. And we'll look at the details in chapter 4 tomorrow. 